Hamza Chemaev still can't find an opponent. Sean Strickland robbed at UFC fight night. And also Drew Dober KOs Bobby Green, then calls out your boy Jalen Turner. We got these topics and more next. Broadcasting live from an undisclosed location. This is the community MMA with your host, Chris Cross. Boom! 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 boom. Dana White Privilege. Dana White Privilege. Dana, Dana, Dana White Privilege. Everybody's upset, 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 upset. This guy's stock is rising fast. Welcome to the community of made your boy Chris Cross. Checking in, another great night of fighting at UFC fight night that led to a highway robbery of Sean Strickland, who lost against Jared Cannonier by a split decision. And when you saw his reaction last night, he was completely upset. And I'll be completely honest with you at the same time, I didn't get to see a lot of the fight night last night. Our internet was in and out, complete nightmare. And... You know, I saw some fights here and there, then it went out, saw some more fights, it went out again, and then I picked up uh, Cannoneer versus Strickland in round four and missed most of the fight. So I was relying on the stats last night uh, when I looked at this robbery, and it's a robbery because Sean Strickland dominated in head strikes, right? He led in significant strikes and then dominated uh, two to one in head strikes against Cannoneer, and Cannoneer. Not a lot of control time to speak of in this fight. Basically had leg shots and body shots, and that carried him to victory. Now, how the final judge went 49-46 is beyond me, but that's the way that this thing turned out. Let's get into the live reaction last night again. I missed most of the fight until the very end and was completely going off the stats, which we do anyway. Man, Jared Cannonier and Sean Strickland headed to a decision after a wild fight. It's all over... 238 significant strikes landed. Now, Sean Strickland led 122 to 116, so it's very close heading into this decision, but the reality is Sean Strickland dominated in head strikes. I mean, when you look at it, it's 109 to 53, which makes no sense because the significant strikes were very close, but it was Cannoneer who's landed a lot of leg shots, 27 to 1. Figured it would slow down Sean Strickland. It did not. And who knows how much credit you get for those, but the head strikes are always most important. But what's more important than anything is round by round. And we had some close ones. And here we go with the decision. Ooh, this is big for Sean Strickland. Cannoneer gets the first one. Strickland's pissed. <laughs> Strickland got the second. Split decision. 49-46. Wow, Sean Strickland is pissed. Wow, 49-46 on the third. I don't get it, man. Sean Strickland and Cannoneer shake hands, but Cannoneer is going to get the win. But wow, I don't get it. I mean, I don't get it because, and y'all let me know what you think, but Sean Strickland, 109 head strikes to 53. More than double. Strickland had a takedown, 48 seconds of control, no big deal. I mean, this is a stand-up striking affair. But Cannoneer was landing pot, you know, power shots to the body and to the legs, which a lot of times a fighter doesn't get credit for as much as the head strikes. And when you're Strickland and you're dominating in the head strikes, forget about it. But that's the way this thing goes down. Cannoneer holds serve, middleweight division, UFC, fight night. Yeah, so that's the way it went down, complete robbery. And then oftentimes, following the fight, the stats are updated. It got even worse for Cannoneer or for Strickland, however you want to look at it. But it was 152 to 141 Strickland in terms of significant strikes. So he led there. Then headshots, 126 to 57. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? 126 to 57, nearly 3 to 1 ratio 
and he still loses the fight. He even had a takedown. So how do you give this four to one cannoneer is completely beside me. And, you know, many people were saying we got to go to the live scoring, which means you can just see the judges results. Uh, as the fight goes on, the fighters would see it too. Sean Strickland still goes into round three, losing the fight, right? He's still down three to one. It wouldn't have changed very much. Maybe he goes for a finish, who knows? But the bottom line is if you have a, or they call that an open, open scoring, I believe. What I'm looking for, and it's amazing we say this every week because there's an, a robbery every week, is a, a full out point system and get rid of the judges. Because if you go to a, if you go to a point system here, Sean Strickland dominates because the head strikes are going to be worth more than the leg kicks uh, or kicks to the leg or any type of shot to the leg or to the body. The head strikes are going to outweigh that. And Sean Strickland would have absolutely dominated this fight <clears throat> if you have a point system. But instead, he gets the loss because two judges said he lost four rounds. And how do you justify that? This isn't one that's close in the numbers. It's complete domination in the stats by Sean Strickland. And he should be number three in the world right now in the middleweight division. But instead, he gets robbed. And what are you going to do about it? There's nothing, absolutely nothing you can do about it in this situation. So we'll continue to talk about uh, a point system, not open scoring, not live scoring, which a point system would be live scoring, but an actual point system like in any other sport on the planet. Boxing is different because you have 10 rounds, 12 rounds, 15 rounds, whatever. Three rounds, five rounds, it's not enough for the judges to have an effect on the fight. We need a point system. So you had some other good fights last night, right? Sarukian dominated Demirius Magulov. You had that. That fight wasn't close. A lot of fights that went to decisions last night that weren't close was just sheer domination on the ground. Like Renat Fakrinadov dominated by, uh, Brian Battle. The whole fight was on the ground. But as we creep down in the main event, you had a big one here between Drew Dauber and Bobby Green. A lot of trash talking by Bobby Green about Islam Mahachev and others. Well, he should have been focused on his opponent because this is what happened to Bobby Green last night. Drew Dauber coming in now. Looking more like a bull continues to move forward. Oh, and Bobby Green lands a nice kick to the body. 225 left. Bobby Green a little wobbled now after taking the left. Bobby Green still swinging though, landing a left and a right. Oh, big shot by Dauber. Finishes Bobby Green with the left and another left. And Bobby Green's checking with the ref saying he's good, but he's not good. I don't think he realized what happened. Bobby Green saying why. And the ref kind of laughing it off because I, I think he realizes too that Bobby Green didn't even know what happened. Yeah, when you get a <clears throat> excuse me, when you get a look at the replay, you see Bobby Green took the left. He went straight down, like he was out of it. And then you had Drew Dober coming in with a hammer fist that was partially blocked by Green. And if the ref lets it go, Bobby Green just gets demolished. And if you're Bobby Green, you go out for a second, you come right back too. You don't really know what happened, and you're upset with the ref. But the ref made the great decision to stop the fight. Now, after the fight, Drew Dober called out Jalen Turner, a guy who is on a five-fight win streak but has been plagued by injuries as of late. So is that why he's calling him out? I don't know. But it, you would get a great fight here if they're both 100%, both guys on major win streaks. So that was a really good call out by Drew Dober, and we'll see what happens. Now, as you creep down this card, you had Alex Caceres fighting last night, a guy that I really enjoy see fighting because he was 14 and 12, and I said he's a different fighter than his record, and he's shown it with like winning six of the last seven, but it could he, the run continue. Well, here's how it went down. And Caceres moving really well here in round one. Is Juicy J having trouble kind of getting those touches in? And Caceres, we talked about him in the past, looks like a completely different fighter here. In his, oh, big left kick to the head. And Caceres is pounding away now, and it's over. Yes. Yes. And as I was getting ready to say, this guy looks like a completely different fighter over the last seven, eight fights. 
I think he's won six of the last seven. At one point, he was 14 and 12. Now he's 21 and 14, I believe. But, man, Juicy J's having trouble getting back to the corner. And this thing ends in a hurry. So you remember, let me explain this first of all. You got guys that are coming up like a Raul Rosas Jr. right now or a Hamza Chamaev or hopefully a Bo Nickel who are just good right from the beginning. Then you have others like Charles Oliveira who was 11 and 8 in the UFC. No one took him serious. That was until he went on an 11 fight win streak and captured the toughest division in the UFC, the lightweight division. So you have guys that peak later in their career. That's what Kiss Harris is doing right now. Now, I'm not saying he's a Charles Oliveira. I'm just saying he's a guy to keep an eye on because now that he's in, you know, he's hit full stride, he's starting to win. And not only is he winning, he's winning big, man. I mean, the guy is winning big. So that's kind of how it went down last night. You also had wins by Amir Albazi, by KO, Mikel Alexichuk, KO Cody Brundage. Then you had Corey McKenna by decision, Matthew Semmelsberger decision, Saeed Nurmagomedov. A uh, big name on the card last night, submitted his opponent. And then you had four other decision wins by Rafa Garcia, Renat Vakrinidov, Manel Cape, and Sergey Morozov. So a lot of decisions last night, six finishes, but all in all, not a bad night for the UFC. Now, Hamza Chamaev continues to remain without an opponent, right? I mean, the guy has been waiting and waiting and waiting. He can't seem to get an opponent. I mean, nobody wants to fight him. You look at the welterweight division, we're waiting on Colby Covington. That seems like it's never going to happen. I mean, how, how long are we supposed to wait on Colby Covington? Middleweight division, nobody wants to fight him, so he's calling out Alex Pereira. So he's an unranked fighter trying to fight for uh, the middleweight title because nobody wants to fight him, right? So what's he supposed to do? They're saying, oh, he's not worthy. He's not ranked in the middleweight division. But when nobody wants to fight you, that's a problem. So what does he have left? Oh, Gilbert Burns rematch. Who cares? That's just more waste of time like the Kevin Holland fight or the Nate Diaz fight. Middleweight division. Maybe eventually you get a Robert Whittaker or a Paulo Costa. But all these guys at the top of the division. Remember when I told you when Hamza was coming up? He was fighting like every week. Right? I think he fought back to back like in a 10 day span. Then won three times over several weeks. Those days are over when you get in the top top 10 because these guys don't want to fight but once every six to eight months. So what are you supposed to do? You don't really have anything you can do. You're just on hold constantly. You're waiting on Colby Covington. You're allowed to be waiting to hear. Colby will wait until his ranking is going to get stripped before he's forced to fight again. And if I'm Hamza, I won't even, I'm not even fighting welterweight again until I get a title shot. That's just the bottom line. So you got Hamza continuing to wait. He's just playing the waiting game forever, it seems like. I mean, forever. Now, as we get into some of the ranking stuff, let's, let's stop it right here on the do list. You got Hamza Chamayev, number one, still waiting. Number two, Islam Mahachev is going to fight Volkanovski at UFC 284. That's a big deal. Conor McGregor holding at three, but how long can we keep him there? This is something we talk about all the time. We need a fight from him in the next six months. Colby Covington at four, which is why the Hamza fight would be great. Colby, one of my favorite guys. Yuri Pahazka's out for a while. Number seven, you got Adesanya on hold. Hopefully getting a rematch. Sterling at number eight. He's the champion of the Bantamweight. Charles Oliveira, we'll see if he can get back to the top. Not likely as long as Islam is there. And then Sean O'Malley getting ready to fight Sterling uh, for the title. That's an eight versus ten matchup on the dude list. So we're starting to get to the point on the dude list where... Some of our favorite fighters are fighting each other, you know, and we got to pick one. Like, I'm going with O'Malley over Sterling. I'm sorry. I'm going with Islam over Alex, uh, Alexander Volkanovsky for sure. So that's just the way uh, that this thing goes. Now, UFC 2022 is complete, right? It's the year of the contenders, the year of the underdogs. We've seen... Titles switch hands in multiple divisions. And of course, as time goes on and we get closer to the end of the year, we're going to do a full recap of this year, including like Leon Edwards' win over Kamaru Usman, Islam Mahachev's win over Charles Oliveira, right? Aljamain Sterling's win 
over Piotr Jan. Yuri Prohaska's win over Glover Teixeira in a now vacant light heavyweight division. By the way, UFC 283, you have Glover Teixeira take on Jamal Hill for the vacant title. So there's a lot to discuss from 2022. 2023 is already uh, shaping up to be an incredible year with big title fights already scheduled through March, including a trip to Australia in February. Think about that. The pound for pound best fighter in the world, Volkanovski, gets to fight at home. And if he wins that, he's the GOAT because I don't think anyone believes he's beaten Islam Mahajib. It don't matter if the fight's in Australia or wherever, even though Australia is the best possibility for Volkanovski. So 2023 is shaping up to be a big year, but we want to get it back into all of the big reactions from 2022. So we'll have that in a separate podcast here in about a week or so. So stay tuned for that. No fighting for the next three or four weeks. So we're on hold. That's a good thing. That's an absolute good thing because we need a break and we need to get ahead on the predictions. As we jump into uh, the, Q- <clears throat> the Q&A, a lot of it on Hamza Chamayev. Homework saying, I absolutely love Hamza, but worst part is nobody wants to fight him. And all his fights take so long to be booked. If we don't get Colby, title shot, or Bilal, simple as that. Yeah, we're probably not getting Colby. So it should just be a title. You know, and if you're the UFC, just give this guy a title shot out of the sheer fact that nobody will fight him. John Locke. For me, it depends which Hamza comes out. The one who is intent on wrestling or the one who gets into a war with Doreen Burns and arguably drops two rounds. People keep talking about a Burns rematch. I just don't see it. Why? Kenneth Bruner, multiple divisions, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight are terrified of Hamza. No doubt. Hamza is being iced out by everyone. They need to step in and make the Pareto fight happen. That's what I say too. The fact that every division is terrified of this guy should let you know, forget the rankings, give him a title shot. Arisandi, I love Hamza, but it is, he is too confident to say that fight mean exercise. Still, he has some bursts from Gilbert Burns, right? Hamza good, but doesn't mean untouchable. And, and I disagree. And of course, you're going to get replies when someone goes up against Hamza. EP man saying if rematch happens, Hamza going to beat Burns easily. He was worried about Burns' jiu-jitsu last time. First time he has been worried about his opponent's skill. Uh, and he continues on, I don't understand what he's saying, but yeah, I get it. And he shouldn't have been terrified at Burns' grappling or jiu-jitsu. Who cares? Hamza is way better. Arisande returns. Okay, let's see the second chance. So let's see what happens when they fight again. Is what he's saying. But, you know, quite honestly, I don't think it really matters. I think Hamza wipes the floor with whoever he fights. It's just tougher at welterweight because he's got to squeeze down so much weight, right? He's got to cut weight. He's probably perfect at 185, really skinny at 170, and dominant at 205 pounds. That will come later, right after he gets two titles. This is nothing new. We've been saying this for three years now. And three years later, we still don't even have a title shot because they're icing them out, man. They're just icing the guy out. But listen, let's wrap this thing up. Until next time, we got into all the hot topics. We'll be back for more. More big fights. 2023 just around the corner. We got three weeks to break it down and get ahead of the game. But for now, this is your boy Chris Cross. Hope you have a great day. And God bless.